Okay, so if you draw an OLS line that fits the points in your data set fairly well, um, you have to do stuff with that. You can you have to figure out the slope and the intercept and other mathy parts of that line, and then you can use those mathy parts to make inferences about your population. Um, so in order to do that, we need to briefly talk about how you draw lines with math. Um, and this will be a review of what you learned back in seventh grade or eighth grade um, when you learned about pre-algebra, um, where you can draw a line using math using this formula here, this y equals mx plus b. Um, I learned it in eighth grade, like they taught us y equals mixing bowl. I don't know why they chose that, like mix b, sure, mixing bowl. Um, but in this world here, this y equals mx plus b thing, each of these letters stands for something. And so y represents some number, x represents some number, um, but what's really important here is the m and the b. The m is the slope of the line which is really just the rise over run. So if you have a graph paper and the slope is like one half, that means you're gonna go up one over two, and then up one over two, up one over two, and that's gonna be your line, that's the slope. If the slope is two, that can be also written as two over one, um, and so that means you're gonna go up two over one, up two over one, so that's gonna be a much steeper slope. If the slope is negative, that means you're going to go down one over some amount, down some amount over some amount, whatever the slope is. The B here is the y-intercept, which is where the line starts um, at the y-axis. And so if the B is like 5, that means you're going to start at 5, and then you're going to do whatever the slope says to do. Um, so some examples of this. If you look at this line right here, this is y equals 2x plus 1, or minus 1. So that means it's going to start at negative 1. That's the y-intercept there, that's our b. And then the slope is 2x, so that means it's going up 2 over 1. And so if you look at the graph, it's going up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1. And so that is our slope. It's kind of a, a steepish line starting at negative 1 going up. Okay. You can also do something like this. Um, the b here is 6, so that means it starts at 6 at the y-intercept. This negative 0.5 means negative 1 over 2. So it's going down one over two, and then down one again over two, down one over two. So that's the slope heading downwards. So you can describe any line using this type of equation with a slope and a y-intercept. Um, the reason we care about this for statistics is you can describe regression lines from an OLS model the same way. It's just that in statistics, we don't talk about M and B anymore. We talk about other things. Um, we use Greek letters. And there's a reason for this. Um, so the whole point of statistics is that we're trying to use a sample to make inferences about a whole population. Again, we can't track the SNAP usage of every single SNAP recipient. That's impossible. There are millions of people out there. Um, and so what we can do is take a sample of SNAP recipients, um, map out kind of the effect of SNAP on whatever outcome we care about, and then make an inference about the rest of the, the general population um, based on that sample. So what we do to make this distinction between the sample that we take, so just the, the few numbers of SNAP recipients and the population, which is all SNAP recipients or all Americans in the country or all whatever, um, we make a distinction between those two things using Greek and Latin letters. So in Greek, if you see letters like beta um, that are just a Latin letter or a Greek letter all by itself, this represents the truth, some unknown, unmeasurable truth that is out in the world. Um, and so if, for instance, we say we know or we don't know, we assume that receiving food stamps has some positive effect on um, improving poverty or reducing childhood mortality or some sort of outcome. We know it has some positive effect, but we don't know what it is. That positive effect that's out in the world, that is our beta. But we have no way of measuring it um, precisely. So what we can do instead is we can add a mark to that letter. So this beta with this little caret sign on top, in, in stats land that is called a hat. So we call this beta hat. That is the estimate of the truth based on our sample. So when we run a regression model to try to get the slope of, of SNAP, like the general effect of SNAP on um, poverty or on childhood mortality or whatever, 
um, that's not going to be the true beta that's impossible to measure. That's just going to be beta hat. That is our estimate of what the truth is. Okay, so that's the Greek side. The Latin side are things that come from our actual data. So if you see a letter like X or Y, these are things that are actually columns in our data set um, that come from our sample. Um, if you see any markings above um, these Latin letters, like this X with the line on top, um, this is, we pronounce this X bar. Um, it just means it's something about X that we're calculating. Generally, when you see an X bar or any type of bar, that means average. Um, so X bar would be the average of whatever this X column is in our data set. So that might be income. So X bar might be average income. Um, so that's, that's this Latin world here. This is actual data that we see in our data set. The Greek side is kind of more ethereal. Um, there's some sort of truth out there that we're trying to measure. The Greek hat version is what, we're, what we can actually estimate and what we hope is close to that truth. Okay, so another way of looking at this is this process here. We collect some data, we calculate some statistic about it, like the average or a regression coefficient. Um, then we assume that that is an estimate of the truth. And so what we're hoping to do is move from data all the way to truth and hope that that's correct. So if you look at this table right here, um, this is an example of, let's say we have, we want to know what the average income is in the country. There is some existing truth right here that it, like the census, if they knew everybody's income perfectly, they could potentially measure this. There's some average level of income in the United States. Um, this is the, the Greek letter mu. It's typically used for averages, but um, it's just here. We'll just say that that's a Greek letter. We have no idea what mu is in real life, though. The closest we can get is this mu hat, or this estimate of what the truth is. So the way we get there is we take a sample of people in the United States, hope that it's a random sample, and then we can figure out the average income in that sample. So that's going to be our X bar. And this is generally some sort of mathematical formula to figure out the average. It could be regression. Um, in this case, this is the, the formula for average. Um, this sigma right here, that is a Greek letter, but it doesn't actually mean anything Greek. That just means a sum. So we're adding all of the x's that we have, dividing by the number of x's, which is how you take an average. Um, so what we're hoping to do is this x bar that we calculate, this average that we see in our data, we assume that that is an estimate of what the truth is in the actual population. We make that leap, um, saying we're going to calculate the average um, income in our data set, and then we're going to say that that is hopefully what it is in the real world. So if you look at this, this pathway here, we're starting with some data. We make a calculation using that data. We say that is kind of the parameter that we care about for the sample. And it's probably, hopefully, close to what we see in the real world. And this is the whole population average. Um, and so that is the process we go through here. The reason this matters with regression is if you remember, we had y equals mx plus b, or you had a slope and a y-intercept. We have the same sort of formula using statistics, only instead of using M and B, we use different Greek letters and Latin letters. So if you look at this formula here, this is the same, this is still Y equals MX plus B, it's just a little bit fancier and Greeky. Um, we still have X and Y, like we had with Y equals MX plus B, but now they have hats on them, um, or Y does. And so in this case, Y is the outcome variable or the dependent variable. And it has a hat on there because it's the predicted version of, of, of the outcome. We don't know exactly what it is. We're using all of these parameters to kind of guess at what the average level of the outcome is going to be. So that's going to be our y hat. Um, that's like when we were talking about averages, we had x bar. Um, we could also call that x hat. It's just that for whatever reason, the convention in the stats world is that when you're talking about averages, you use bars. When you're talking about regression output, you use hats. You could do whatever you want. All, all that really matters is, is that this hat is there because it is a calculation, which means it's a Latin letter with some marking on it. So this is the calculation that we're making here. Okay. The calculation that we then use is we have this beta zero hat and beta one hat. 
Those are, so this beta zero is the y-intercept. This is b in the y equals mx plus b world. Beta one is the slope. That is the m in the y, y equals mx plus b world. They're both Greek letters, which means they are something that we're trying to measure that exists out in the world. We assume that there's some true intercept and some true slope. And we're using our sample to kind of guess at what those true intercepts and true slopes are. They have a hat on them because we don't actually know what they are. We're just hoping that they're right. Um, and so that's, those are the parameters that we care about, the slope and the intercept. And then x right here is just the, the x that we have in our data set that we've measured. Um, the last little bit we have here is this fun thing called epsilon, which just means error. This is the residual stuff. This is the stuff that we can't measure. So we're trying to predict y. Some of y is going to be explained by x, um, and some of it's just going to be explained by other stuff. If we go back to the cookies example, that line that we drew did not perfectly explain everything. There was that one person who ate five cookies who had a lot of happiness. There's something else that ex that's explaining why they had such high happiness. That something else, we don't know what it is, so we just say it's in there. It's in epsilon. It's some error. Okay. Um, when you see these equations written in the real world, often you'll see them without hats on the Greek letters. You'll still see it on the Latin letters because that means it's a statistic that we're calculating. But when you get to these parameter type things, often you'll just see it without the hat um, because, again, the, the leap that we're making is we're saying this parameter that we care about that exists out in the world, we're hoping that it represents the whole population. Um, and so if you write this formula as just beta zero plus beta one x one without the hats, that happens all the time, that's fine. Um, you're just assuming that you're hoping that beta zero here represents the whole population um, and you can just make that assumption. So often just for the sake of simplicity, you'll see it without the hat and that's totally fine. Okay, so if we go back to our cookie and happiness example here. Um, here's our graph showing the number of cookies that you eat and the happiness that you get from the cookies. This is our best fit line using OLS. So this minimizes the distance between, or minimizes the squared distance between the points and the line. Um, we can write this using um, this formula here again. This is our estimate of y, our predicted happiness, based on some intercept, some slope, the number of cookies you eat, and then some error we don't know. Um, we can write this with actual words, which I prefer doing um, when I write equations. I hate seeing equations that are just a whole bunch of Greek letters and X's and no, and no explanation of what they are. Often you'll see like a whole paragraph after the formula that says X means this and beta means this and gamma means this. That gets really confusing. It's easier to just like include the actual words in the formula. Um, so here we have predicted happiness or happiness hat. Um, which sounds like a really fun thing you'd wear at a party, the happiness hat. Um, so happiness hat equals beta zero, which is the intercept, plus beta one times the number of cookies you eat, plus some error. So what this really means is that this is basically a, a formula predicting happiness based on cookies. So if we can figure out what the y-intercept is, which if we extend this out, this is probably 1.1, 1.2-ish here. Um, if we could figure out the slope of cookies, what that means is we could say this person on the street ate four cookies. Let's guess what their happiness is. And you can do that by plugging in four here. So it'd be 1.1 plus whatever the slope of this thing is times four. That's going to be their predicted happiness, which if we look right here, it's probably 1.8, 1.7 ish. I'm just looking at the graph there. And so that's how you can use this model to make predictions about the future. Um, so the way you do this in R is you use this function called LM, which stands for linear model. And the syntax for it is you do your Y, um, whatever the name of the variable is, and then you do this tilde sign, which is on your keyboard by the number one. Um, you just have to press shift and then that, that tilde key by the number one on your keyboard. Um, the way I like to read that so I can remember how these formulas work is I read this as is explained by. So y is explained by x. Or in this case, you'd have happiness is explained by cookies. Um, and then you tell r what the name of your data set is that has those columns. Um, you don't have to have just one x. You can add multiple x's, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and so if you do this linear model, 
y is explained by x with this data here. Notice how I have this arrow pointing backwards to name of model. That means I'm storing the output of this, this model as the, this object here. So I can do stuff with it. So I have this object called name of model, and then I can, I can look at it, I can manipulate it, I can see what's inside. Um, if you run the summary function on that model, you'll see a whole bunch of model details. What I like to do though, um, there's this fun package called broom that will convert models into data frames, um, which means it'll have a whole bunch of rows and columns, um, which makes it really nice for plotting later. You can plot specific coefficients um, and you can, it's easy to convert all of these, these coefficients and results into an actual data set. Um, so tidy will convert the model results into a data set. Glance will convert all of the model diagnostics to a data set. That just means like the R squared value and the AIC and the BIC and a whole bunch of other things that always show up when you run a regression model. You kind of look at and say, whoa, that's a lot of numbers. Um, that's all inside of Glance. Okay, so if we run this cookies and happiness model in R, um, this is again our model. We're saying predicted happiness or happiness hat is some intercept, some slope, times the number of cookies you eat, and then other stuff we can't measure. So in R, we would run this, assuming we have a data set called cookies data that has a column called happiness and a column called cookies. Um, this would run the model for us. We could say happiness is explained by cookies, and the data is in cookies data. And we stored this as an object called happiness model. So then we want to do stuff with that. So if we run tidy, what that will do is show us all of the different coefficients in the model. So here's our intercept, 1.1. So if we look back at this graph, that means this line is going to start at 1.1 at the y-intercept, or at the y-axis here, which is accurate. Um, if you drew this line all the way out, it hits right there at 1.1. So that's good. Um, the next thing, so that's our beta 0. The beta 1 is going to be the slope for cookies. So if we look here, we have cookies, and it has a slope, um, which is 0.16. So what that means is in our graph, we're going, it's rise over run. So we're going up 0.16 over one, up 0.16 over one. So if we look back at our graph here, um, you can see that you're starting at 1.1, we're going up one, up 0.16 over one, up 0.16 over one, up 0.16 over one. And so that's how we're drawing the line. Um, another way of interpreting that is saying every time you eat a cookie, you're going to, on average, get 0.16 points of happiness. Um, that's essentially what it's saying. So if you're here at the four level, you eat another cookie, your predicted happiness is going to be a little bit higher. And then your predicted happiness is going to be a little bit more higher. So it's just increasing as you eat more cookies. And so that's what that shows. Um, if you run Glance, this is where you can see all of the other kind of model diagnostics. You have R squared, which shows um, how good of a fit the line is. Um, you have a whole bunch of other um, F statistics and residual errors and a whole bunch of other stuff that we don't care about so much for this class. It's all there. Um, so the neat thing about this is now we have the formula for cookie-based happiness. Um, because this was our formula. We had beta, one plus, beta 0 plus beta 1 times cookies. We can actually plug numbers in to these betas now. And these betas, again, are things that exist in the world. We think that there's some true relationship between happiness and cookies. We've hopefully measured it correctly here. And if we have, then this is what it is. Um, that your happiness is going to be 1.1 plus 0.16 times the number of cookies you eat. So that means we can plug in any number. We say, I ate seven cookies today. How happy am I going to be? So you plug seven in here. So seven times 0.16 is some number plus 1.1 is going to be, if we look at the graph, it's going to be like 2.3-ish, maybe. Um, so that's our predicted happiness, given the cookies that we that we ate. Um, so if we're talking about prediction, that's like, this is fairly easy to do. You just plug numbers in. This is what Netflix does to you. Um, as you watch a show, every one of their variables has some um, parameter to it, some beta estimate. And so what they do is they say, this person has watched these 15 different shows in the past two months. It is currently this time. They're currently in this location. It is currently this day of the week. And so they're just plugging in each of those things into their formula. And then it spits out a predicted show. In this case, this spits out predicted happiness, but it can spit out whatever you're predicting. Um, and so that, that's what's happening with, with this line. It's making predictions about happiness. 
if we're talking about explanation, we don't care so much about the predicted happiness, we care about the coefficient on cookies. We want to know what the effect, the causal effect of cookies is on happiness. And if we assume that we've isolated the causal relationship between cookies and happiness, we've gotten rid of all the confounding factors and we know that this is a causal story, then we can talk about this using causal language and we can say, eating one cookie will give you 0.16 happiness points on average, and that is the causal effect. And so in explanation land, we focus on the, on the X, or the causal effect of eating a cookie. In prediction land, we're focusing on the Y, or happiness, trying to get the best prediction of happiness given all of the data that we have. Okay, so if you have a single variable, um, there's a template that you can use when you're, making, when you're interpreting these regression models, and this is the template. You say a one unit increase in X is associated with a beta one increase in Y on average. So in this case, you would say um, a one unit increase in cookies is associated with a 0.16 unit increase in happiness on average, which is a really stilted way of talking about this, but that's kind of the formula that you can use, the template that you can use. So eating an additional cookie will give you on average, or is associated on average with a 0.16 level or number increase in happiness. Okay, so that is the template for a single variable if you're doing a regression. But you're not limited to just one variable. Um, in your stats classes, hopefully you got to the point of multiple regression, which is where you add a whole bunch of different variables. Um, and this is the formal equation for it. Notice I got rid of the hats because we're just assuming, we're hoping that that is the, the population parameter of beta. Hopefully it is. Um, so this is, you have an intercept, but you also have a slope for one of your coefficients or one of your x's. You have a slope for another x. You have a slope for another x. To however many x's you stick in there, they're each going to have their own slope, um, which makes it really hard to visualize um, because no longer do we have just a y-axis and an x-axis. We have like four different x-axis and y, like z-axis, and so you're in like this multiple dimension space, and it's really hard to visualize that. Um, we're no longer just in line world, um, which makes it harder to interpret these things. But I'll give you some, some templates for doing this. Um, the way you do this in R is you just add a whole bunch of other x's using the plus sign. And so if we switch back to the miles per gallon database or data set that you've been using in the RStudio primers, um, it has a whole bunch of different columns. In this case, we're going to predict highway miles per gallon. So we can read this as highway miles per gallon is explained by displacement, which is engine weight, cylinders, which is something in the engine. I know nothing about cars, but I use this data set all the time because it's there. Um, and then drive, which means four wheel drive, rear wheel drive, or front wheel drive. Okay, um, so that is our car model here. So we're going to say, like, if we write it out as a formula, predicted highway miles per gallon or highway hat um, equals some intercept plus beta 1 times displacement plus beta 2 times cylinders plus beta 3 times front wheel drive and beta 4 times rear wheel drive um, because those are categorical variables. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, so if you run this model, you'll have an object called car model, and then you can do stuff with it. So if you run tidy on the model, you'll see something like this. Um, so notice we again have our intercept, that's our beta zero. We also have beta one, beta two, beta three, and beta four. And so there's our formula. We can actually plug these things in um, to the actual beta coefficients. And so if we wanted to predict highway miles per gallon, and we knew some car out in the world, um, if we knew the number of cylinders it had, if we knew its displacement, and we knew it was front wheel drive, we can figure that out. We could say the number, whatever the displacement is, times negative 0.12, number of cylinders times negative 0.15, or negative 1.45. Um, and then if it's front wheel drive, then add five, and then 33. Once you do all of that math, it'll spit out predicted highway miles per gallon. Um, and that is the, the highway hat. Um, you can also focus on specific coefficients. If you just want to know the effect of displacement on miles per gallon, then you would only look at this guy here, this negative 1.12, and that is the thing you would care about. Okay, but interpreting these things gets a little bit tricky once you do multiple ones, because you can't just draw a single line as a slope anymore. We're in a, in a weird world of, of, of lots of things going on. So the way I like to think about this is with this analogy here. You have 
um, if you have a light switch in your house, you, you have a switch that just turns things on and off. You may have a slider type of thing also um, that will make your light less dim or, or, or less dim, dimmer or brighter. Um, so you can slide this and then the light's going to get brighter or dimmer as you do that. And it also has a switch. You can turn it on and off. If it's off, that means it's dimmed all the way to zero. So you have sliders and you have switches. The reason I talk about this is these map really nicely onto regression variables, um, but specific types of variables. So categorical variables in a regression are like a switch that are either on or off. Um, so with that car example, we had front wheel drive. A car can't be a little bit front wheel drive. It's just either going to be front wheel drive or not, or rear wheel drive or not, or four wheel drive or not. And so there's, those are basically switches. You turn it on or you turn it off. Continuous variables are more of like sliders where you can move them up a little bit. So you can say, well, take displacement and move it up by one and then move it up by another one and move it up by another one, slide it down. So you can manipulate the continuous variables by moving it like this. Um, with categorical variables, you're just turning it on and off. And where this is really helpful is when you start interpreting these things. Um, if you come back to this, displacement is a continuous variable. So that means we can interpret this as a slider. So you say, as you move displacement up by one, then miles per gallon is going to decrease by one. So moving displacement up one is associated with a negative 1.12 decrease in miles per gallon. You move it up two, then displacement is gonna go down by negative 2.24, I think, whatever 1.12 is times two. Um, so that's where you get the slider effect. Cylinders is also a slider. So you might have four cylinders, you can move up to five, move up to six. And this coefficient is telling you what happens to miles per gallon every time you slide it up or down. Drive, on the other hand, is a, is a switch. It's either on or off. Um, in this case, see how it says DRVF and then DRVR. Um, technically, in this data set, there are three types of drive. There's front, there's rear, and there's four-wheel drive. Um, four-wheel drive is not in this list. It's because it needs some sort of baseline um, when you're looking at the other coefficients here. And so the omitted, ver the omitted category is going to be what everything is based on. So what this means is um, when we're talking about a switch with this front-wheel drive, this is a switch. So if you are a front wheel drive car instead of four wheel drive, because four wheel drive is the baseline here, it's called the base case. So moving from four wheel drive to front wheel drive increases your miles per gallon by five. Moving from front or the four wheel drive to rear wheel drive is a switch. And so that means you're moving from whatever the level is at rear wheel drive and you're adding 4.89 miles per gallon once you hit the rear wheel drive switch. So that's that's kind of the metaphor um, that you can think about when you're interpreting these regression results. Um, you have sliders for the continuous variables and you have switches for the categorical variables. And with categor categorical variables, you always have an omitted case or the base case. And that means everything is based on that. So there's no four wheel drive here. So that means you're moving from four to front or four to rear. And that tells you the effect of, of flipping that switch. Okay. Um, so when you're interpreting these things, though, um, every time you include a new x variable in your model, that x is explaining some of the variation in y. So some of the variation in miles per gallon is explained by the number of cylinders you have. Some of that variation is explained by the weight of the car. Some of it is explained by front wheel drive versus four wheel drive versus rear. Um, and each of those variables explains some part of it, um, which is why we include other things in there because it helps explain, it helps take away some of that variation so that we're left with just kind of the predicted version of our outcome. But when you're interpreting these things, it's trickier because when you talk about each of these coefficients, you're only really allowed to move one switch or slider at a time. Um, and so the official language that you use, which you hopefully learned about in your stats classes, you're holding things constant. So if we come here to our continuous variable here, um, the, the template you can use for interpreting these things is this here. You'd say holding everything else constant, a one unit increase in X is associated with a beta increase in Y on average. 
So what that means is we have this coefficient for displacement here. So if we want to know the effect of displacement, we have to say we're not going to move the cylinder slider. We're not going to flip the front wheel drive switch or the rear wheel drive switch. We're just going to move the displacement slider, and that is all. And so that holding everything constant means we're not moving any of the switches or sliders around except the one we care about. And so in that situation, you'd say on average, a one unit increase in cylinders. So we're going to hold displacement steady. So one unit, so moving from four cylinders to five cylinders. I don't even know if five cylinders exist. Maybe they do. We'll pretend they do. So moving from four to five means you're going to have 1.45 lower miles per gallon as a result on average. Um, but we didn't change any displacement. We didn't change drive. We didn't change anything. We just moved one of those sliders when we were interpreting it. Um, you do the same thing with categorical variables. You say holding everything else constant, y is going to be the beta units larger or smaller compared to the emitted factor. So here we have front and rear. The missing category is four-wheel drive, so everything's based on that. And so you would interpret front-wheel drive here, this 5.04, as on average, front-wheel drive cars have five higher, miles, high, five higher highway miles per gallon than four-wheel drive cars, because that's the base case, on average, holding everything else constant. So we didn't change any of the miles, per, or we didn't change any of the displacement, we didn't change any of the cylinders, we didn't touch any of the sliders. All we're talking about is flipping one switch. And that's how you interpret these individual coefficients. Okay? The last thing we're going to cover really quick, and you'll see this in your future readings and in the readings for this week, is economists and econometricians or statisticians who do economics, they love Greek letters. Um, so far, we've only worked with beta, um, which is a regression coefficient. But in the economics world, in all of your readings, you'll see a whole bunch of different Greek letters. And so this equation here came from your reading and mastering metrics. Um, you have an alpha, you have a beta, you have a gamma, and then you have um, an epsilon that is kind of almost an E. Um, this is just, economists like to make distinctions between each of their Greek letters instead of calling everything beta. So in this world, alpha is the intercept. That's the same as just saying beta zero. Alpha is just another way of, of writing it. This beta, there is still a beta, but it has a specific meaning. This beta is the one thing that you care about. And so in this example, this is the effect of um, some program on um, outcomes. I can't remember the exact um, outcome they're looking at. I think it was like income. Um, so you're just trying to find the exact effect of the program on the outcome. And so the causal effect here is this beta. The other things in here aren't betas. Um, so this gamma right here is the identifying variable. So this was saying like you had a treatment group and a control group. Um, that's what A is. And so being in group A meant that you were in the treatment group. Being not in group A meant that you were in the control group. Um, and so rather than just saying beta 2, um, they called it gamma as the identifying variable. Why? I don't know. Um, it does kind of make it more clear, like beta is the one you care about, gamma is the identifying variable, sure. But this is not consistent across papers. Um, every economist will make up their own Greek system, and then you'll have to have a paragraph after the formula saying, um, this is what all of these different letters mean. Um, and that's just what happens. You'll also see this, this subscripted I. That means it's for an individual. Um, so really what we have is a beta, some average for every individual in the, in the data set that we have. Um, often you'll see these I's. You can generally ignore them for the sake of this class. This is just showing that the data set is for individuals. That's all we really care about. Um, you'll see it even more complicated. This is also from Mastering Metrics. Um, you still have the beta which is the main causal effect that you care about. You still have the gamma, which is group A or not group A, but then they put other control variables in here, um, like SAT scores or parental income. And so for those control variables, they used delta as the coefficient because they just did. Um, so if you look here, like alpha again is the intercept, beta is the one coefficient that you care about, that is the causal effect of the program. Gamma is the identifying variable, treatment or control. And then delta are all of the other control variables. Um, neat. Um, technically, these are all the same thing. Um, you can either do the economist thing where you distinguish between what each of these variables do, 
or you can do just call them all betas and give them numbers. And so you have beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, beta 4. In R, it's all the same thing. It doesn't actually care. So if you were running this regression, you had a data set called income data. Um, then you have a variable called private. That's what this is. That's, that's the program, being in private school. Um, and then being in group A, your SAT score and parental income. Um, so it, it doesn't matter in R. Um, personally, I like the beta version. Um, and just having a whole bunch of zeros and ones and twos and threes, that's easier for me instead of trying to remember what gamma is supposed to mean today and what delta is supposed to mean today, especially because this is not consistent across um, studies. You'll see it all over the map. Um, so choose whatever you want. If you, When you're doing the readings and you see a whole bunch of Greek letters, in your mind you can just translate them all to betas. All that means is they're slopes. Um, they're all coefficients in a regression model. That's all they are. Um, so that is a quick, super brief introduction and review of regression.